Good afternoon. I'm your host, Brian Bachmeyer, here at the Law and Crime Report. We're looking at the Kelsey Thomas case. This is a case out of Iowa where the prosecutor is getting a second bite of the apple. Now, the first trial happened in March where the defense walked away with an acquittal on the lower charge, endangering a child that resulted in death, but a hung jury on the top charge of murder in the first degree. A peculiar outcome, but this time it's even stranger because they're going with a bench trial. They had a lot of success with a jury trial, but for some reason we're going with the judge. Now, no opening statements in the second trial, but let's go back and look at the defense's openings in the first trial to see what kind of layout or what kind of plan we might see a second go around. False confessions are a real life thing. And in this case, you folks are gonna hear from Dr. Brian Keller, who is an expert on interrogation and false confessions. Brian Keller is going to tell you about how he reviewed the interrogation of Kelsey Thomas. He's going to tell you about the many known risk factors for false confession that existed during that interrogation. Dr. Cutler will testify that while he can't tell you if Kelsey Thomas is telling the truth, because nobody can tell you if Kelsey Thomas was actually telling the truth, he'll testify that in his expert opinion, that interrogation created an environment which would encourage both an innocent and guilty person to confess. You'll hear Dr. Cutler quantify the number of many different tactics that were utilized in the interrogation of Kelsey Thomas. You'll hear him testify about the known purposes that investigators know in employing these tactics. In Vor Dyer, ladies and gentlemen, you indicated that the circumstances, the context of Kelsey Thomas's confession would be important for you to know. And Dr. Brian Cutler is going to give you a lot of that context. And context is important. I think both sides agree on that. And because context is important, it'd be important for you folks to know that the evidence will show that when Kelsey Thomas, moments after finding her daughter, called 911, she told the 911 operator what she saw. And then moments after the chaplain at the hospital announced Chloe's death, Kelsey Thomas was whisked away into a private room by another member of law enforcement and asked again what had happened. In the next coming days, the evidence will show, in fact, the next day, that she voluntarily conducted a video walkthrough with the police at their request. You're that her so-called close cousin, Brittany Johnson, volunteered to surveil and monitor her with no results. And the evidence will show that Kelsey Thomas completely cooperated with every aspect of the police investigation. All right, so Ashley, as I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, all right, you've got to somehow float this false confession argument in front of just a judge. I actually don't think this is false confession. I think this is an immense amount of guilt. And this is why I think that I used to coach kids soccer and I've seen some of the most amazing mothers, like spectacular mothers, blame themselves when their son goes into a tackle and like gets up, end up spraining their, their wrist or their ankle. It's my fault, I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have put the kid in the sport, I shouldn't have done this. And I think this could be a situation, not a false confession, but a mother that is so guilt stricken that she's blaming herself. I think that argument might work with a, with a, with a mother of a judge rather than making the false confession argument. What are your thoughts? I agree. And I think it's, um, you know, listening to this defense opening statement, I think the defense attorney, and of course, I have the benefit of, you know, looking back on it and, you know, from an outside perspective. But I think the defense attorney was just a little too, you have a side in this case, you know, argue vehemently for your client. And he said, you know, nobody can tell you whether or not she's telling the truth. Uh, well, I don't know that I'd be saying that. I don't know that I'd be as agreeable with the prosecution's version of events, you know, argue, argue, argue until even an opening statement when you're not supposed to argue until they tell you you have to stop arguing. Um, so, yes, I think it absolutely could be viewed as, hey, she's guilt, guilt stricken because 
um, you know, the child ended up ended up this way and it has nothing to do with her involvement at all. And that's an argument to be made. But I'm not sure why they're not making it uh, in this case. And again, they didn't make an opening statement at all to the judge in this case. So I think they're, they've just waived their opportunity to do that, period. All right, Katie, I, I tend to agree with Ashley, but I also think that maybe our styles of defending line up a little bit more. I, I agree. I would argue everything. I mean, I won't, I won't argue that the sky is or is not blue. That might be a little too far, but I, I can hear the strength in, uh, in, in Ashley's arguments. Do you think the defense the first time around maybe conceded just a little too much? Yeah, because immediately I seized at that same part that made me kind of feel funny when, when he said, well, nobody knows if she was telling the truth. I was like, well, isn't that exactly the jury's job is to figure out that she's telling the truth? Isn't it exactly my position that she obviously is telling the truth? I mean, not only that, but I think that this whole line about the false confession is a red herring uh, because, Brian, I'm totally with you. She was confessing. She was confessing that she felt like she was a crap mom, that she failed her kid, you know, that she didn't, she wasn't enough. And that bears so heavily upon her that she couldn't stop talking to her family members about that while she was in jail. She felt like that death was on her hands, morally, right? But legally, it's not. And I think that that is a huge distinction. I like that. And I think that the, that would have been a beautiful visual for a jury if there was one here. There's a difference between being morally guilty and legally guilty, and we have to decide, or you have to decide as a jury, uh, which one she is. Let's listen to a little bit more of the defense's opening statements and see what we might see in this upcoming trial. The evidence will show that from the moment she dialed 911, through numerous conversations, through all of this interrogation, her story remained the same until the very end. And all of this, Imagine, imagine losing your daughter, and then this is what you face. All within a week of losing Chloe. And these pajama pants that you just overheard the state indicate. Kelsey admitted, confessed, that she strangled Chloe with. You're gonna find that throughout those hours and hours and hours of interrogation, I'm estimating maybe 10 or 12 hours of interrogation. Investigators were telling Kelsey Thomas, it is impossible. The science tells us those pajama pants could not have made those marks. And so you have to ask yourself, how is it that after hours and hours of telling Kelsey Thomas that these pajama pants could not have created these marks and could not have been the cause of Chloe Chandler's death, then the investigators decide, okay, we'll go ahead and accept that as long as you're confessing. All right, so this is more, again, into the false confession narrative of the officers feeding one story but believing that it's not true and she responding as such. Again, it, it, I think it kind of maybe plays into itself. Is this a, a woman who feels morally guilty, as Katie was saying, but not legally guilty, and the confusion and all of that happening at once. Katie, do you think that blend is something that could lead to a false confession that enough for a judge to believe it? Yes, but you know, again, this this trodden, overly trodden path of the false confession is dangerous, especially with the judge. Because listen, we all know that false confessions are a real thing. I mean, 100%, right? But if you go down that theory, that it wasn't necessarily false, but she actually did feel guilty. I think it's a better sell because we all know the cops are allowed to lie during confessions or rather during interrogations. They're just allowed to do it. And so that type of argument of, of equity, that it's not fair, it's not right, is it gonna fall more deaf on a judge's ears rather than a jury. So I stick by my former theory. She was feeling guilty, but it, she just wasn't legally guilty. Yeah, and actually this, the false confession issue that I have with this is it's so mechanical. We've all heard it enough times that we know A plus B plus C uh, equals a false confession, but I've never really heard it in the context of a mother who has recently lost a child. That can be a huge monkey wrench that might throw off the analysis of false confession that a judge may say, you know, I don't totally agree because I don't see A, B, and C as I usually see with false confessions. 
Well, and typically with false confessions, what we see them with more often is juvenile defendants. So somebody who has is not a mother, you know, so like the Central Park Five, right? Um, you know, kids that are coerced into believing in authority and really going with whatever their version of events are, just sort of being agreeable. Uh, here she made statements, you know, that I agree with Katie sound like a mother who it feels guilty that her daughter is dead because she was not the be in her mind the best mother not necessarily because she's the one that strangled her daughter to death so i think that's just a better a better narrative for the defense to go with we'll see how that works out i think that if if the defense is going not only on the law and making a strong legal argument that's why the bench trial but also maybe know something a little bit personal about the judge having three kids maybe that's the angle that's working here but we're only going to find out uh once summations start up you have to find out when you come back after this break Welcome back as we continue our discussion of the case out of Iowa, where Kelsey Thomas is going through her second trial. This time around, it's a bench trial where a judge will decide whether or not she's guilty of first-degree murder in the death of her five-year-old daughter, Chloe. Now, let's listen to more of the defense's opening statement, not from this bench trial, but from the former trial just not too long ago in March of this year, where the defense opened with like this. And while you might consider the so-called confession of Kelsey Thomas the state's biggest piece of evidence, as the state indicated, you're also going to hear from the state's associate medical examiner, Michelle Cavalier, who will testify that in her opinion, Chloe Chandler died of strangulation. And there are a couple things that the defense would like to preview for you folks on this topic. First of all, Dr. Michelle Cavalier did not come to that conclusion at the end of her autopsy. Dr. Michelle Cavalier did not come to that conclusion until after she had learned that Kelsey Thomas confessed. It was then that she made her finding of strangulation. And if that confession, if in your minds, is not valid, if it's not good, and that was the basis of Dr. Cavalier's opinion. And that really calls into question everything about the state's case. So, Ashley, this is a common argument that I've seen a lot of medical experts actually change their practices altogether because defense attorneys will often say, well, you've got the packet, you've got the arrest report from the officers, and you're merely connecting their dots or trying to find answers to their conclusions, and that's affecting you or giving you some sort of bias when you're testing. Uh, this seems to be a large argument that sometimes works with juries. I'm not sure how well it's going to work with a judge. What are your thoughts about this whole, well, you were biased because of the paperwork argument? I mean, I think it is human nature. I don't care, you know, how long you've been a medical examiner. If you've got a, a narrative in front of you that says, okay, this woman has already confessed. Here's what we're looking for. Your brain is naturally going to start looking for evidence confirmation bias, basically. We see it in politics, we see it in our social media, we see it in, you know, uh, pretty much everything. It is simply how our, how our brains work. And so I don't think it is an unreasonable argument to make that once the medical examiner saw, oh, okay, this lady has confessed to killing her daughter uh, by strangulation, that's what I'm looking for. I'm going to find the facts that back, or the, or the physical evidence that backs that story up. Yeah, it makes sense, Katie. I mean, math was never my strongest subject. I used to always go to the back of the math book and I'd figure out what the answer was. And then I'd be like, all right, let's try to figure out how to get to that. Um, I think if you present it to the jury in, in, in that kind of way or a judge in that kind of way that makes them feel safe, that doesn't make them feel like they're being horrible people, can this confirmation bias argument, as Ashley has so well articulated, really go far for the judge? Yes, I love Ashley's point because it, I think it's overselling it to say it's malicious. I think it makes sense when you're selling it as this is just human nature. And we do know that medical examiners are even allowed to take into account those peripheral um, judgments that the cops make that are not necessarily based on hard fact or are interpretive. You know, uh, for example, the idea of confession. 
that is a completely up in the air fact whether or not she actually confessed. So telling the medical examiner, having in the paperwork that this person did indeed um, confess, they were acting guilty, you know, they had a motive, all these other sort of soft factors that you can't unsee when you read those reports are going to impact the human being who is the medical examiner. So not coming after them that they're a liar and that, that this was malicious, but rather you're a person, you were trying to do the right thing, and it seemed to be the right thing to do to pin this on her. Exactly, especially when the right thing to do is find the killer of a five-year-old child. It, it makes sense that they want to find that finality for that child, but you've got to make sure they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's and finding the right person and not just trying to push it ahead to find any person. Uh, let's listen to a little bit more of the defense's opening statements as he said he was going to outline the case in that previous trial. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my client, Kelsey Thomas. Prior to her life being completely destroyed by her daughter's death and its aftermath, Kelsey was a young married woman, mother of Chloe Chandler, age five, Phoenix Thomas, age two. Her husband worked up by the airport at Plastipac. She was cooking her, your pizzas at Casey's General Store. There are Kelsey Thomases in our town and everywhere across this country that due to their life circumstances would be an easy target for assumptions. And this is what happened in this case. Any parent unfortunate enough to find their child in the circumstances that Kelsey Thomas found and could not explain would find themselves in Kelsey's position now. And just like the juror, prospective juror that we discussed in Bore Dyer, when she was asked, well, do you remember your wedding? Well, I remember getting married. I don't remember all the details. On July 19, 2018, Kelsey Thomas knows it was burned in her brain. She found her daughter hanging that day. She can't quite explain how she got her down. The fact that she couldn't explain it started all this. And think of the source, as she's the only witness. If this were all just a scheme on the part of Kelsey Thomas, why would she just not tell a different story? I kind of like this defense attorney, Katie, and the, and the thing that gave me pause, he had a little bit of swagger. I'm surprised that that didn't permeate into a bench trial. I think the judge would have liked it. I, I mean, why hold that back? I know, I know. I thought so, too. He, he definitely, he does have some swagger. He's got some style. I think I want him to go a little harder, like just take it a next step farther into hammering into some of these facts. Again, it's hard for us to see because we're only seeing snippets, but my, my, I think it's just my bias, man. Like I have a bias that I think a jury trial is the best thing. And unless I have a very, very specific factor. So do you remember the one case that was in Massachusetts about a girl who sort of convinced her boyfriend to kill himself? That was a perfect example of what I thought was appropriate for a bench trial. I'm just not feeling it here. Yeah, but here, uh, um, and that's a perfect example. Ashley, in comparison to that, here there's a bit of an emotional aspect to it. There's a mother who feels guilty that she lost her child because she took a nap, something that every mother should be allowed to do without worrying about their child. But unfortunately, that's the reality for so many around this country and around this world. Your heart goes out to her to some degree. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but why not do the jury? This, this could have worked out so much better, I feel. I know, and you got a hung jury on, you know, the first, uh, the first count. And, you know, obviously they weren't all able to agree on murder. Uh, it just seems too dicey, I mean, too chancy to, like, take it to a bench trial and just allow a judge to decide, um, especially when you've got, I mean, I like the way that that defense attorney connected it back to questions that were asked in voir dire, which, you know, it, we don't ever get to see because, you know, they're closed. And, uh, but all the jurors sitting there will remember the questions that were asked and people telling their personal stories. And that's how you get to know your jury pool and get to, you know, figure out what their biases are. 
And of course, any mother of a five-year-old child wants to take a nap. And I mean, I feel terrible for this woman that just hearing that, that, okay, that's the point in time when she took a moment to herself that she found her child dead afterwards. I think that speaks volumes to any mother sitting in the room. Yeah. Now the question is, will one mother sitting in the room, one mother who is also a judge, be able to come to that same conclusion? Katie, I know we just got a few moments left before we go. Uh, what are some of your final thoughts on how this may play out when we come back to the trial? I want more motive. I want more solid motive. It, it, I feel like that's flimsy, and I think if you need to push it over the edge, even though it's not something that you have to prove, I think it's important, even with the judge, to understand why would she do this. Ashley, same question as we're about to head out. What are you, what are you looking for more in this trial as we, as we look down the road? I agree with Katie. It, there's got to be a reason that she did this to her child if she did strangle her child to death. You know, was it in a fit of rage? Is she prone to fits of rage out of frustration with her child? I don't know. But, you know, we're not seeing any history of that. So I'm curious to see how this all works out. Yeah, and we know from the first trial, there was actually no history of either ACS or any kind of abuse to the child. We have this one thing about her wanting to give up the child to the mother for a one point. But that seems, again, like a mother who's overwhelmed but still wants the best for her child. There's nothing really indicating that she had any motive or any kind of reason, unless you're thinking a fit of rage because the child wouldn't go to sleep. I don't know. That might be a bit of a stretch. We'll see how the prosecutor connects those dots. Ashley... Katie, I want to thank you as always for joining us and lending us your expertise and your time. I know you're both very busy defense attorneys, uh, so thank you for that again. We're going to continue with more of the IOV Kelsey Thomas case, but I won't be here anymore. Instead, you've got Bob Bianchi taking over the reins. He'll be able to lead you through this as we get more live testimony out of Iowa. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good day, guys.